Bienvenue dans l'entretien de France Welcome 24. Welcome to the France 24 interview. Chappas, my guest today is Marlène Schaffat, French Femme Minister Bonjour, for Gender Equality. Good afternoon and thanks for being with Alors, us. Le coronavirus uh, the coronavirus and lockdown have put a serious strain on all government services, uh, but some are even more of a strain than others. You've been fighting against violence against women for a very long time. This is one of the main issues you deal with, but lockdown has made this phenomenon even worse. A lot of women are trapped. Uh, and what are the new means and how effective are the new means that you have devised for women to call hotlines when they're trapped with an abusive husband? Indeed, that's the hard part. When a woman is in lockdown with her violent spouse or partner, which makes it more difficult for them to call for help, either because the response mechanism is difficult to access or because it's hard for a woman to call for help while your perpetrator is in the same room. So it's necessary to provide multiple possibilities for sounding the alert. So you can send a text to the 114 emergency number. There's no need to talk. You can also alert your pharmacist during an errand. This is in line with commitment by Interior Minister Christophe Castaner. You can call for help through your pharmacy and law enforcement will send help to the pharmacy. We have also set up facilities where abused women can find assistance in a sympathetic ear in shopping centers that are still, still in operation. When a text message is sent off to 114 or women uh, talk to a pharmacist, what happens? Uh, does the police show up? What is the procedure? Absolutely, that is definitely a possibility. Here's the procedure. When you call for help via a text to a special 114 number, it is the same procedure as on the government platform. Arrêtons les violences. Stop the violence. .gov.fr. Police officers have received specific sen sensitivity training and they can stage an intervention in case of an emergency. Uh, the perpetrator can be placed in police custody. A number of abusive individuals have already been placed in police custody by law enforcement after pharmacies sounded the alert. What about the next step? Well, either the abusive spouse has to stand trial. I know the courts are currently at a standstill, but domestic violence cases are a priority. The goal is to make sure that women are no longer forced to live under the same roof as their perpetrator. So violent spouses can be evicted from the home. This happens every day. Yes, uh, these abusive men are sent away from the premises. Uh, where are they housed? Uh, are they sent to a hotel, uh, to a special uh, set of shelters? How do you deal with that? Normally, when they're not sent to jail. Yes, absolutely. There are accommodation centers. Another possibility is a summary trial and a prison sentence. The abusive man is sent to jail. And there are other possibilities. The abusive spouse can be provided with alternative accommodation. So provisions have been set aside for financing 20,000 hotel nights, working together with the Justice Ministry and the SOS support group. So we have created a platform that finds immediate alternative accommodation so as to evict the violent spouse from their home during the lockdown. So there are different possibilities. Either the woman manages to get away or an end is put to the violence between the cohabiting couple by providing the spouse with alternative housing. Paid for by the government. There's another system uh, that ha uh, focuses on uh, men, on abusers. Uh, they can also call a special hotline and uh, be dealt with with, uh, they can be either housed elsewhere. Uh, have you had a surge in calls to that hotline? Yes, absolutely. And this is why I decided to create this hotline. The lockdown is a collective plight that collides with everyone's personal and family history. And this can generate outbreaks of violence and anger. We know conflict and violence are two different things, but conflict can lead to violence. 
So the message we're trying to get across is, don't hit, call for help instead. Some abusers, of course, are perverts that find the violence enjoyable, whereas others prefer to call for help. They've been victims of violence before, and they prefer to call for help before violence sets into their home. So we have received over 100 calls the first week. And so the callers are taught by psychologists to manage their anger so they won't tip over into violence. So can they learn to manage their negative emotions? And this can, of course, mean that they are provided with out-of-home accommodation if the psychologist on the phone determines it's necessary. Very often, uh, abused women are very afraid of reporting uh, the person who is abusing them. They usually live with the person in question and they don't have the means to move out. Uh, how can you actually help women who are suffering, who are not uh, talking about it, but you realize that she's being abused? How do you help a woman like that? Thank you for mentioning that. That is indeed the most difficult situation, particularly during the lockdown. It is possible to help abused women by letting them know that they are not alone. You can slip a note under the door or in the mailbox. You can voice your support from your window at 8 p.m. every night when you cheer for our frontliners. If the woman is a family member, make a call, send an email, catch up, ask how they're doing. That's the first step. Women who are abused find it easier to open up if someone asks. If you don't ask the question, it's going to be harder for them to take that first step. Lastly, and most importantly, in case of emergency, law enforcement can intervene. If you hear shouting, if you hear screams, if you hear death threats, don't hesitate. Police will be dispatched, despite the lockdown. Have you had the opportunity to talk to your foreign counterparts, in particular those in Italy who've had longer experience with lockdown than we have? Uh, have you exchanged information, ideas? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And what did they say? Well, we exchange information on a regular basis. Tomorrow I'll have a talk with the Swedish minister. Yesterday I held discussions with the UN and with the OECD. I'll be in touch with my Italian counterpart. So we talk all the time. And that's good for France because Italy is eight to ten days ahead of France when it comes to lockdown issues. So we can compare their data with our data, and there are lots of similarities in terms of the surge in domestic violence and also when it comes to response mechanisms. So these conversations are very valuable. We get to exchange best practices. What I said earlier about the help spots in supermarkets, this is an international best practice that has been selected by the United Nations and shared by other nations, which means that women all over the world can use this mechanism. And this uh, facility in supermarkets, are you going to retain it after lockdown has stopped? I believe that the lockdown is forcing us to work in innovative ways. It's also an opportunity for other stakeholders to get involved. By way of example, the Olympique de Marseille soccer club has turned its training center into an accommodation facility for abusive spouses. It's an amazing show of solidarity between the soccer world and uh, abused women. A lovely show of solidarity. And all of these new players, whether businesses such as Auchan, Monoprix, they're getting involved. For example, hotline number and other emergency channels are found on supermarket purchase receipts. And I believe that these players will want to maintain their involvement after the lockdown. So we're working together with them already to try and make the mechanism a permanent one. And one last question. Um, in the media, and the social media in particular, people have wondered whether Germany, New Zealand, uh, Finland, countries where the head of state is a woman, uh, have been managing the crisis better. At least that's what you read in Forbes. Uh, apparently, women have more empathy, more integrity. How do you react to all that? 
To be perfectly honest, I am somewhat skeptical when it comes to that. I believe this line of thinking has the effect of essentializing female heads of state. Last month I was in Finland and the Prime Minister said she wanted to be judged on the basis of her skills as opposed to her gender. She's, uh, she's in the, her early 30s, so if we start saying that women are softer and have more empathy and are more open to other people, that's a slippery slope. because. Very soon you'll be saying that, okay, well, you're then you should stay home and you should do the unpaid work and you should serve coffee during meetings and raise the children and do homeschooling. And I don't think we should disregard their own specific qualities and competences. I believe personality should take precedence over gender. Some men have a lot of empathy, a lot of sensitivity, while women, or some women, are very bossy. But remember Christine Lagarde, when she was head of the IMF, said that if in 2008 Lehman Brothers had been called Lehman Sisters, uh, banks would have been uh, somewhat different in, differently treated. And she's a woman, and a successful woman. I remember that. Yeah, good for her for being a successful woman. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marlene Chapa. Uh, maybe you can give the hotline numbers uh, back. Go ahead. It's all yours. Yes, call 3919 to get a sympathetic ear. Dial 114 to send a text. Dial 17 for the emergency number and go online to the stoptheviolence.gov.fr platform. You can reach someone 24-7. Thank you a lot, Marilyn Chapa, for having been with us this afternoon. And good luck to you and stay safe. Goodbye. Hi, I'm François Picard in Locked Down Paris. And I'm Melinda Crane in Mostly Shut Down Berlin. Different countries, different systems, different approaches. The worst may yet be to come. So, will COVID-19 bring Europe together or tear it apart? Join us for a joint special edition on Deutsche Welle and on France 24.